The spoils of war shown by Azeri public television of Armenian tanks and other hardware, proof, the army says, of territory taken in the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region. While liberating our native lands from the enemy, we seized several pieces of enemy hardware and drove them to our military bases. Currently, the fighting continues. We are liberating our lands from occupation. More videos released on Thursday show the unrelenting destruction from the air, drones targeting Armenian guns and military convoys. The region is officially part of Azerbaijan, but it's run by separatist Armenians. It has taken six days for world leaders to jointly call for Armenia and Azerbaijan to return to peace talks known as the Minsk process. With a warning from French President Emmanuel Macron for Turkey to cease its involvement in the conflict. We have information today that is very clear that indicates that fighters from Syria have left there, they're members of jihadist groups and they travelled via Gaziantep to join the fighting in Nagorno-Karabakh. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has pledged Azerbaijan his country's full support and says the time for talks is over. Minsk Given that these three Minsk countries, the US, Russia and France, have neglected this problem for nearly 30 years, it's unacceptable that they are involved in a search for a ceasefire in the face of these negative developments that came to surface in recent days. But if something is wanted, the invaders should leave these lands in order to achieve a solution. The true gains or losses being made on the battlefield are unknown. This Armenian military video suggests its forces are resisting and in some cases retaking lost positions. But what is known is that the violence continues to injure and kill civilians. In the town of Martuni on Thursday, Azeri shelling wounded two French journalists from Le Monde. One is now in a critical condition. Robin Forestier-Walker, Al Jazeera. Well, let's hear now from Bernard Smith, who's in Stepanakert in Gorno Karabakh, and he says that neither side is willing to negotiate for a ceasefire. Armenia's defense ministry says that on Thursday morning, an Azerbaijani helicopter was shot down by them and then went on to crash in Iranian territory. And then there was shelling on Thursday afternoon into Nagorno Karabakh territory. And it was during that shelling in a town called Martuni that a local journalist was killed and he was working with two French journalists from Le Monde newspaper and one of those journalists was also seriously injured. Armenia's Prime Minister Nicole Pashinyan says that he believes Turkey is sending fighters from Syria and mercenaries from Syria to fight alongside the Azerbaijani forces and he now says that the front line Nagorno-Karabakh has become a clash of civilizations and a battle of survival. And Artsakh, that's what the Armenians call Nagorno-Karabakh, is fighting against international terrorism sponsored by Turkey. So no mood, certainly from the Armenian side, to look towards a ceasefire and talks at this stage. Well, let's hear from Sinem Kosyolu now, who has this update from Azerbaijan's capital of Baku. Tension is really high by the border, especially up on the nor uh, northeastern side of Nagorno-Karabakh, where uh, a, a district called Tertar has been under attack by the Armenian forces uh, since the early morning. And uh, we heard that a civilian lost his life this, uh, uh, this early morning in Tartar, uh, as the civilian areas have been indiscriminately targeted by the Armenians, as the Azeri officials and his uh, defense ministry has been is saying also uh, down to uh, south around Jebrail and Fuzula districts uh, that have been occupied also by the Armenian forces. Uh, the fight has been intensified as well. Just uh, let us remember a couple of days ago, we heard that Azerbaijan military was uh, able to take over some villages, regain control of the, uh, some villages in Fuzula district. Uh, but uh, currently now we have two battle points, uh, one in the north is Tartar and down uh, is the Fuzula Jebrail area and uh, the officials uh, have been accusing Armenia for indiscriminate targeting of the civilians and uh, as also uh, Bernard put, uh, put through Azerbaijan is also seeking some support on the international level uh, because when you speak to the officials they always complain that the area is uh, under 
uh, uh, Armenian occupation. These are not disputed lands. These are our lands and our lands are being attacked by the Armenians again from our lands. This is what the Azeri officials have been saying since we arrived here uh, last Monday. Well, let's speak now to Paul Stronsky, who's a senior fellow at the uh, Russia and Eurasia program at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, joining us from uh, Washington, D.C. So, Paul, this issue of Syrian fighters or mercenaries, Turkey's denying it, France and Russia say it's true. Uh, if it is, what are the implications of it? Well, it's deeply troubling uh, if it is, and, and both the Azerbaijani and, and Armenian gov uh, uh, Turkish governments, as you say, are, are denying this and denying this uh, vociferously. Uh, however, over the last few days, there's become uh, increasing a little bit more evidence, uh, first in the Russian press, then the European press, and I think now with Macron publicly stating this uh, and, the, and the Russians uh, clearly indicating that. Um, uh, it is quite disturbing. Uh, this isn't the first time we will have seen mercenaries um, uh, and rebel groups uh, involved in this conflict. It happened in the 1990s, where we had Chechens and, and uh, large members of the Armenian diaspora coming up from all around the world to help fight this war. But it's not something we've seen in the past um, uh, 20 years. And I think it's particularly uh, disturbing, given the sort of the, the fact that Turkey and Russia are at loggerheads uh, in Syria, they're at loggerheads in Libya, and in many of these places, they're also using proxies. Um, and so I think this is a very unwelcome development, if it indeed is true. Right. And who would have facilitated this and why? Um, it seems to be, uh, you know, the Turks uh, are, are facilitating it. Um, why is the big question? Um, I don't quite understand why a country like Azerbaijan, which has spent so much money um, uh, enhancing its military, um, uh, it is a Shia country, why they would be importing Sunni uh, irregular forces. But again, they did it in the past, uh, 20 years ago. Um, and I think, um, uh, you know, uh, Azerbaijan has always had a difficult time when it comes to uh, retaking uh, uh, this territory. Um, and I think uh, this is a, uh, a way in which both Turkey and Azerbaijan can, can have some deniability, uh, both to their uh, uh, own populations, uh, as well as in the international community, particularly if, this, um, uh, if, if the war does not go uh, as, they, as they hope it does. Generally, Paul, what do you make of what's happening and, and the fact that all entreaties uh, to a ceasefire so far being ignored by both sides? Um, I think uh, we are seeing uh, this happen at some of the worst times it could happen in the, in the global environment. We have the COVID-19 pandemic, we have the U.S. election, so Europe uh, and the United States are really not paying attention. The United States used to be highly involved uh, in previous administrations, but not so much in the Trump administration. Uh, and we're also seeing, I think, the limits of Russian power. Uh, in the past, in the, when they had a war four years ago, uh, Russia, within four days, was able, able to convene everyone, get them to the sides, get them to a ceasefire, which the United States, France, European Union, and all the other parties blessed. Uh, at this time, uh, Russia does not seem to be able to do that. Um, and it doesn't even look like Russia is able to get uh, the Azerbaijani president, at least President Putin, is not able to get the Azerbaijani president uh, on the phone. There's no record of any phone calls um, between uh, Moscow uh, and, and Baku at the head of state level uh, since this all started, even though there's plenty of phone calls going uh, across capitals uh, elsewhere dealing with this. And so I think this also, it, it, it impacts, you know, the, the fact that, that, that Russia is, is struggling to, to bring this under, uh, under control. And I think that is in, in part because of Turkey's much more assertive role and much more assertive backing of Azerbaijan this time. Uh, given everything you said there, what's the danger of this escalating? Um, I certainly think this is, you know, a, a, does have a dangerous uh, potential to escalate. It certainly could escalate into sort of the proxy type uh, battles we are seeing between Russia and, and Turkey elsewhere uh, in the world. Um, I, I think, you know, the fact that this could bubble over into Iran uh, as well uh, is disconcerting. And I know Iran has also urged uh, uh, calm. It's also criticized these reports of, of irregular forces uh, now being deployed. Um, uh, and I think we also need to remember that, you know, Russia is a uh, obligated as a treaty ally of Armenia, if Armenia itself, not Nagorno-Karabakh, the, the territory, but if Armenia proper, the international uh, boundaries of Armenia are threatened um, or, or are attacked, uh, uh, Armenia can ask Russia for assistance. And that would then pit, um, you know, Armenia and the CSTO um, in, a, in a conflict in which a NATO um, ally is participating. I hope we don't go there. I hope, um, you know, the, the international community, and I do know the United States, uh, Russian and French presidents today came out with a strong statement, a, a unified statement. Um, uh, but I think they're, they're all re recognizing the severe danger okay. this has, both for the region and the wider, wider area. 
Uh, Paul Stronsky, we do appreciate your time. Thanks very much indeed for that. Thank you. All right, let's uh, get the view of the U.S. administration. We can join Kimberly Halkett at the White House. Uh, Kimberly, what's been the latest reaction from there? Yeah, I asked the White House press secretary about this statement that has been issued by the United States, France, and also Russia, the request by these three world powers for there to be a halt in the escalation of violence. Uh, there certainly is the feeling here in Washington that this sort of form of a diplomatic confrontation, if you will, could fuel tensions between both Russia and Turkey. So I asked the White House press secretary about that and if there are fears in the White House that this could escalate beyond a regional tension. So President Trump, along with President Putin, as you noted, and President Macron, uh, representing the co-chair countries of the OSCE Minsk Group, um, released a statement condemning in the strongest terms the recent escalation of the violence along uh, the line of contact uh, in the conflict zone. And we call for an immediate cessation of hostilities between the relevant military forces. And we also call on the leaders of Armenia and Azerbaijan to commit without delay to resuming substantive negotiations in good faith and without preconditions under the auspices of the OSCE uh, Minsk Group uh, co-chairs. Now, the U.S. president was asked about this on Sunday. At that time, he said that he is looking at the conflict very strongly, that he believes the United States has good relationships in the region, and if so, will try to use those relationships to cease the violence and the confrontation. This is what has followed now, this statement being issued by the United States, as well as uh, France and Russia. Uh, but in terms of the next steps, it appears that this White House is is looking towards the mechanisms of the Minsk group to try and quell the hostilities. Kimberly, thanks for that. Kimberly Halkett there, Washington, D.C., at the White House.